Welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast, season 22, episode 10, Burma 44 to 45. This episode was written by Thomas Hall. A note about Allied forces in Burma. This episode deals with the 1944-45 operations of the British Empire's 14th Army, but describing the 14th Army as a British Army is misleading. It conjures images of jaunty Cockneys and Dewar Highlanders giving their all for king and country, and while there were Cockneys and Highlanders, even Canadians, most of the 14th Army came from Nepal, India, Burma and Britain's vast African colonies, Gambia, Gold Coast, Kenya Colony, Nigeria, Northern Rhodesia, now Zambia, Nyasaland, now Malawi, and Southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. On December the 14th, 1944, an unusual order rang across the Imphal Plain. Lieutenant Generals, by the left flank, Mark. So ended the investiture ceremony in which William Slim and his three corps commanders, Geoffrey Schoons, Philip Christensen and Montague Stopford, had been knighted by the Viceroy of India, Archibald Wavell. The laurels were well earned. In the 43-44 campaign season, Slim's 14th Army had crushed the Japanese invasion of India, inflicting massive casualties and seizing several bridgeheads on the Chindwin River. Their reward was mixed. The commanders were knighted and ordered to drive the Japanese from Burma. The task was a formidable one. The Japanese had been mauled, not destroyed. They could shelter behind two of the world's great rivers and would be able to fall back upon their supply lines. 14th Army's supply lines would stretch hundreds of miles over roads that were too narrow, too steep, and too poorly maintained to support volumes of mechanised traffic. It could expect ferocious opposition from well-entrenched Japanese who had proved to be masters of defensive warfare. Both forces would have to deal with Burma's unforgiving environment, seemingly impassable mountains and swamps, malaria and assorted tropical fevers, not to mention tigers, rogue elephants and poisonous snakes. Logistics, however, gave Slim cause for optimism. The previous season the Japanese had wasted the veteran corps of their army against the defences of Kohima and Imphal. More had starved during the retreat across the Chindwin. Beyond that, the massive industrial output of the United States was being felt, even in Burma, at the bottom of the Allied priority list. By 1944, Japanese forces could muster 20 tanks, their air forces numbered in the dozens, opposing Allied resources of 1,200 craft. These were mostly transport craft, but ultimately key to supporting the 14th Army's rapidly moving forces. At the peak of the fighting, 14th Army would require some 7,000 support sorties each day. Judging from his memoirs, one of Slim's greatest fears was that Allied Supreme Command would reassign his vital air transport. Events proved his concern well-grounded. On December 10th, 1944, Slim awoke to watch a substantial portion of his air transport depart in Fall, never to return. They had been transferred in response to Japanese offensives against American Chinese airfields in China. The lost capacity would materially hamper the 14th Army's manoeuvrability. Slim began the 44-45 campaign with supreme confidence. He had begun planning it in June 1944, while fighting still raged around Kohima and Imphal. The Japanese had conformed to his 43-44 plans almost to the letter, and he believed he had their measure. While he admired the boundless courage of the individual Japanese soldier, he viewed their officers as men of limited imagination, and their doctrine, their commitment to offensive operations and their refusal to admit defeat, as deeply flawed. 
This assessment drove Slim's initial battle plan for 44-45. He expected the Japanese to stand at the first major obstacle, the Zibyatorgdan Mountains, 25 miles east of the Chindwin. As Slim understood his opponents, a Japanese general would not surrender territory without battle for fear of losing face. Having learnt dangers of direct assault on Japanese entrenchments, Slim planned a pincer movement to force the Japanese out of the mountains and on to the Shwebo Plain. There they would be blocked on three sides by a loop of the Irrawaddy and meet for Slim's armed forces. Slim regarded his principal obstacle to be distance. Mandalay is nearly 250 air miles from Imphal, putting it at the limit of Allied air support. Mactilla was well out of range. Overland transport was largely restricted to one narrow road, impassable for long stretches in bad weather, simply keeping his troops supplied with food and ammunition, not to mention removing the sick and wounded, would tax Slim's administrative apparatus. A miscalculation could put the 14th Army at the mercy of the same enemy that had broken the Japanese outside Kohima and Imphal starvation. 14th Army staff reduced the problem to simple mathematics. By their best estimates, they could support four and two-thirds divisions, plus two tank brigades east of the Chindwin. Japanese strength was estimated at ten divisions, a hundred thousand line of communication troops, one tank brigade, twelve thousand troops of the Indian National Army, and seven battalions of the Burma National Army. While Slim doubted the combat value of the Indian and Burma National Army troops, he expected the Japanese to fight to their last bullet. Underestimating the enemy could result in the annihilation of the 14th Army. To reduce that risk, Allied plans called for an American-Chinese offensive in northern Burma and another British assault in the Arakan, primarily to reduce the forces that could be brought against the 14th Army. The Arakan offensive would provide an unexpected benefit. Captured islands would become homes to Allied airfields, dramatically extending the range of air support available to the 14th Army. These divisions, it was hoped, would leave only five and a third Japanese divisions, one tank regiment, one mixed brigade, perhaps some 40,000 line of communication troops, and two Indian National Army divisions opposing the 14th Army. Rather to Slim's surprise, however, Tokyo had learnt from the debacle of 43-44. Generals Kawabe and Mutaguchi were recalled to Tokyo and replaced by Haitaro Kimura, who was given an unenviable task, turn Burma and Siam into a fortress zone against Allied forces, using local resources to make his command self-sufficient. One may wonder who General Kimura had offended in Tokyo to receive such a plum assignment. Losses from 43-44 were made good with some 30,000 replacements, although most were inexperienced and many in poor health. He had on hand some 45,000 tonnes of supplies and perhaps 500 motorised transport to supply a theatre extending hundreds of miles in any direction. 14th Army's crossing of the Chindwin and passage over the Shwebo Plain would be opposed by minimal rearguard troops. While Slim had expected his opponents to waste their troops in a glorious, if doomed, stand, Kimura was a far more sober soldier than his predecessors. Knowing he was badly outmatched, General Kimura fell back past the Zibyatorgdam Mountains, across the Shwebo Plain and beyond the Irrawaddy, to the shelter of Mandalay on the river's east bank, with a massive supply depot at Muktila, some 90 miles to the south, and some 60 miles from Pakoku, on the Irrawaddy. Safe inside fortified Mandalay, guarded by the vast Irrawaddy, Kimura believed he could repulse any British attack and defend his fortress zone without putting his meagre resources at undue risk. Had he fought west of the Irrawaddy, his forces would have been exposed to the 14th Army's superior mobility and firepower with a major river at their back. 
East of the Irrawaddy, however, General Kimura could hope to win any battle of attrition. The river was wide, the city well fortified. Kimura could reasonably expect to withstand a direct assault, and then, perhaps, pursue and crush the weakened British forces. In many ways he was hoping to repeat the 43-44 in reverse, allowing the British to waste their strength against Mandalay, just as Slim had done months earlier at Imphal and Kohima. Slim launched his offensive with the end of the monsoon on November 29, 1944, crossings of the Chindwin began. In another demonstration of the vast material resources of the Allies, one crossing utilised a Bailey Bridge 1,154 feet long, the longest such bridge in the world at the time. Opposition was slight. Within five days of the crossing, 19th Division was drawing near the rail centre of Indore. Slim realised that General Kimura had no intention of fighting on the ground favourable to the Allies. As Slim put it, it was time for him to exercise the quality he prized most in his commanders, flexibility of mind. It was a quality he possessed in abundance. William Slim was born on the 6th of August 1891 in Bristol, England. His family subsequently moved to Birmingham. His father's business failed, meaning his parents could not afford to send him to university. Nevertheless, he joined the Birmingham University's Officers' Training Corps and was commissioned a second lieutenant at the outbreak of World War I. He was wounded at Gallipoli, recovered, returned to service, and was wounded again in 1917. Evacuated to India, he was ultimately transferred to the Indian Army. Between the wars he rose steadily in rank, participated in punitive expeditions to the Khyber Pass, attended the Indian Army Staff College, taught at the Staff College in Camberley, England, and was ultimately appointed head of the Senior Officers' School in Belgaum, India. In World War II he led the first British offensive of the war against Italian forces at Galabat. It failed, which Slim would later attribute to his undue caution. He was wounded for a third time in January 1941 and invalided to India. Upon recovery, he returned to the Middle East. In March 1942, he was commanding the Indian 10th Infantry Division when Archibald Wavell plucked him from the desert sands and assigned him to the jungles of Burma to extract the British forces shattered by Japan's offensives of December 1941. He would later boast that he held the record for the longest retreat in the history of the British Empire, some 900 miles, with an enemy in close pursuit. Once in the comparative safety of Imphal, Slim began to restore, resupply and retrain his forces. The training included a number of novel doctrines. All troops were required to take weapons training, even rear area and supply troops. A man who believed in leading by example, Slim went through the course himself, apparently much to the amusement of his Gurkha bodyguards. He would later describe himself as adequate with a rifle, but hopeless with a Bren gun. The terror of the retreat had been the roadblock by which the Japanese would infiltrate past retreating forces and cut off their line of march. Given that British troops were tied to the jungle trails and meagre roads, this tactic was potentially devastating. Slim's solution was twofold. He committed to building a force that could move on and off-road with equal ease, and he declared that forces cut off by the Japanese were not, in fact, cut off. Rather, they had the Japanese right where they wanted them. Supplies would be dropped by air and the Japanese were to be held in position until additional forces could be brought up to crush them. The jungle is neutral. More, the Japanese were not natural-born jungle fighters. There are no jungles in Japan. The Japanese had training and experience on their side and nothing more. Events would prove that East African troops were more at home in the jungle and were believed to have greater resistance to certain tropical diseases than their opponents or their European officers. Mobility was paramount, leading to substantial cuts in supply trains and reliance on motorised transport. 
air supply would be one of the distinguishing features of the campaign. Indeed, Slim went so far as to designate certain units as air transportable and ordered that their equipment be stripped to only what could be transported by C-47s. A glance at the map of Burma suggested Slim's new course, demonstrate against Mandalay to occupy the Japanese main force while making a surprise thrust towards Maktila. Taking Maktila would cut the Japanese off from their existing supplies and indirect resupply. Maps, however, can be deceiving. Leveling mountains and valleys, transforming vast rapid rivers into placid blue lines, emitting swamps, ignoring the absence of roads, standing mute regarding endemic disease. Moving sufficient forces into position without drawing the attention of the Japanese would also require skill, guile and no small amount of luck. It was a campaign that would require Slim's full attention. To that end he requested, and his Commander General Giffard agreed, that Slim be relieved of responsibility for the Arakan front and the rear areas that had until then been Slim's responsibility. When Slim grasped General Kamura's battle plan, his Indian 33rd Corps was fully engaged against the Japanese rearguard as well as the Indian 19th Division of 4th Corps. The balance of 4th Corps was not engaged, allowing Slim to use it for the surprise attack on Muktila. Again, the plan was simple in conception, difficult in execution. Slim began by changing out corps commanders, Geoffrey Schoons, who had held Imphal with such dogged skill, was promoted to a rear area post and replaced by Frank Massavi, who Slim would describe as sanguine and not too calculating of odds. His new assignment would test the sanguinity. Fourth Corps would have to be shifted from 14th Army's extreme left flank to its extreme right, an overland trek of 300 miles through Japanese-held territory over inadequate or non-existent roads in complete radio silence. At one point, the trail of vehicles stretched from Pork to Kohima, a distance of 350 miles. Radio silence was necessary to hide Fourth Corps' moves from the Japanese. A dummy corps headquarters was set up and sent out a steady stream of traffic, indicating that Fourth Corps was still on the left flank. While 4th Corps was more than a match for any of the Japanese rearguards it encountered, the task of clearing a way fell to two lightly armed brigades, again to hide the presence of 4th Corps. When solid opposition was encountered at Pork, it was overcome with a massive, at least by the standards of the Burma campaign, airstrike. The timetable called for 4th Corps to complete its movement in two months. While Slim's target was Mactilla, it was essential to conceal that goal from General Kimura. To that end, steady and increasing pressure was brought to bear on Mandalay. In mid-January 1945, units of the 19th Indian Division crossed the Irrawaddy north and south of the city, provoking stiff resistance from Japanese troops and helping to fix General Kimura's attention. The stratagem was successful. General Kimura transferred additional artillery and a portion of his remaining tanks to support Mandalay. A larger crossing on the Mandalay front was staged on February the 13th. Downstream, 4th Corps launched its drive on Mactilla from the region of Pakoku. To add to his deception, Slim spent a week battling for Pakoku proper to persuade the Japanese that he intended to attack from that point. When the crossing came, it was made on a broad front, again intended to hide 14th Army's objective. One thrust was aimed at Nyangu, another at Burma's ancient capital of Pagan. Both were nearly disastrous, as inadequate boats broke down in midstream, exposing their passengers to relentless fire. Japanese fire at Nyangu was ultimately suppressed by airstrikes and massive artillery support. Accounts of the Pagan crossing conflict. Some hold the Japanese inflicted heavy losses before withdrawing, leaving troops of the Indian National Army to fend for themselves. Others describe the crossing at Pagan as nearly unopposed. The result was the same. 14th Army was across the Irrawaddy in force. 
by February the 21st it was poised to strike in any direction. The strike, of course, was aimed at MacTilla. The Japanese infantry fought with their traditional defiance and courage, but had no effective response to the 14th Army's tanks. Lacking armour of their own, or air cover, or even anti-tank guns, the Japanese troops improvised. Strapping explosives to their chests, they would throw themselves beneath oncoming tanks. A different expedient was encountered at Mandalay. Surviving a field prior to a tank advance, a British intelligence officer thought it looked oddly pockmarked. Personal investigation disclosed that the pock marks were shallow pits in which a Japanese crouched with a 500-pound bomb and a brick. When a tank passed over, the bomb was to be detonated with the brick. Ordered to await tanks, these would-be tank killers offered no resistance as the intelligence officer moved from pit to pit, shooting each man in the head. By March the 2nd, MacTilla was under assault from three directions. By March the 3rd, the city had been taken. On the 4th and 5th of March, resistance in the surrounding environs was crushed and the airfield secured. Yet the battle remained in the balance. Although the 14th Army had put five divisions across one of the world's widest rivers with inadequate equipment and overcoming vicious opposition, and dominated the Irrawaddy from north of Mandalay to south of Pakoku, those five divisions were heavily engaged, and Slim had only one in reserve. It remained for the 14th Army to draw the Japanese from the fortifications and destroy them or itself be destroyed. This fact was not lost on General Kimura, who moved aggressively to retake MacTilla. The counter-offensive lasted three weeks and moved Slim to commit his last reserve division, which arrived by air under heavy fire on March the 17th. By March 29th, however, the Japanese were spent, being driven back with heavy losses in lives and equipment. Slim would later observe that the Battle of MacTilla sealed the fate of the Japanese in Burma. Even General Kimura would acknowledge it as the masterpiece of the campaign. Simultaneous with 4th Corps' battle for MacTilla, 33 Corps launched from its bridgeheads around Mandalay. 19th Indian Division broke out on the 26th of February. By March 4th it was an open country, ideal for its tanks. Additional breakouts occurred in early March. Everywhere the Japanese were in retreat and suffering heavy losses. Yet despite the hammering they had received, they retained unit cohesion. Slim expected General Kimura to try to reform on a line running southwest from Kayukse to Chalk, and moved ruthlessly to prevent any recovery. Key towns fell in succession, and the pace of the 14th Army's operations soon surpassed the ability of the Japanese to respond. They had irretrievably lost the initiative, and soon Japan's Burma Area Army headquarters was out of touch with events and its troops. Many of those troops were now little more than armed refugees fleeing through the Shan Hills. Sensing his opponent's disarray, Slim launched his 4th and 33rd Corps on a race towards Rangoon that displayed a rare command of combined arms tactics and masterful and logistical control. Armoured forces surged forward, scattering what organised resistance existed, all the while supplied by aircraft landing on one improvised airstrip after another, airstrips built by engineers heedless of the Japanese who held the surrounding ground. Time was of the essence. The monsoons would begin in May and render the roads impassable. Indeed, the monsoons came a week before Rangoon, abandoned by the Japanese, fell. George MacDonald Fraser's war memoir, Quartered Safe Out Here, provides a vivid first-hand account of the race towards Rangoon. The prize was taken, but much fighting remained. Four and thirty-three corps had cut two long, narrow salients from MacTilla to Rangoon, scattering Japanese troops to either side. Defending these salients, four corps' salient was some four hundred miles long, placed additional burden on the talents and resources of Slim and his staff. Three months of mopping up remained ahead, as well as no small amount of political turmoil. On May the 7th, 1945, Oliver Leese, Slim's immediate commander, flew to MacTilla 
and informed Slim that he would not command the next phase of Allied operations, the amphibious invasion of Malaya. In Lise's mind, Slim would be promoted out of operational control, and Philip Christensen would command the Malaya operation. The reasons for this decision are unclear. Lise had stated that he thought Slim very tired. Others point to personal antipathy between the two. Slim apparently received Lise's news with equanimity and announced his retirement to Lise and Auchinleck, Commander-in-Chief India. At this point, Lise was undone. His personal superior, Admiral Mountbatten, Supreme Allied Commander for Southeast Asia, had unquestioning faith in Slim and put the matter to Field Marshal Alan Brooke, Chief of the Imperial General Staff. Mountbatten maintained that Lise had exceeded his authority, that Mountbatten had personally prohibited any plan that involved Slim's removal from command. Brooke had always questioned Lise's fitness for command of an army group. Lise was recalled to England, and Slim promoted to succeed him. The invasion of Malaya never occurred, forestalled by the atomic bombs that ended the war. Writing after the war, Slim predicted that atomic warfare would require new tactics, that combatants would seek to engage one another closely and continuously to avoid being atomized by the opponent's atomic arsenal. While atomic weapons never became a battlefield staple, Slim's words were prescient. In Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh would urge his troops to seize their American opponents by their belt buckles to negate superior American firepower. Masterpiece has become a cliché, but it applies in its true sense to Slim's 44-45 campaign. Bold strategy was combined with daring tactics, exquisite judgment of risk, control of an active front stretching hundreds of miles, and always immaculate attention to detail. A lesser general might have been lured into a stalemate, or worse, at Mandalay, or been destroyed at Mactilla. Slim not only succeeded, but ushered into being the modern concept of all-arms warfare. Afterward, General Kimura was convicted of war crimes, including preventing atrocities against prisoners of war in Burma, and hanged on December the 23rd, 1948. William Slim was promoted to Commander-in-Chief of Allied Land Forces, South East Asia, in July 1945. In that position, he sat at Admiral Mountbatten's side during the surrender of Japanese forces in the South East Asia Theatre. In 1949, he was promoted to Field Marshal and appointed Chief of the Imperial General Staff, succeeding Bernard Montgomery. From 1952 to 59, he served as Governor-General of Australia. In 1959, he largely retired from public life and returned to Britain. He was created a Viscount in 1960 and died of natural causes in 1970. His account of the Burma campaign, Defeat into Victory, was published in 1956. As a military memoir, perhaps its only rival is Slim's irreverent account of his broader career, Unofficial History, published in 1959. Today he is commemorated with a statue in Whitehall alongside Bernard Montgomery and Alan Brooke. And there we have it for another season of the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. We will be back later in the year with season 23. But in the meanwhile, please keep sending us your suggestions for subjects to cover and your scripts too, if you feel so inclined. Just drop us a line if you want to do that. You can really help us out too by either making a donation at the website using the donate button on the home page or by purchasing some of our past seasons to keep you company in between now and season 23. Our past seasons available through the website Storelink are convenient chaptered files which you can download for just £2 each. As ever, we would love your likes, comments and interactions with us on our Facebook page but it just leaves me to say for now a huge thank you on behalf of Angus and myself for all of your support this season, for your ideas and scripts and donations, and of course, for listening. Thank you all, and see you in a few weeks' time.
You've been listening to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast, Season 22, Episode 10, written by Thomas Hall, read by Nick Barker.